Hi everyone, welcome to this LSA presentation from the 2022 Linguistic Society of America's annual meeting. Um, this is the Chirilla Historical Linguistics Lab talking about how usable are digital collections for endangered languages, a review, um, alternative subtitle, how to do a language archival deposits better. Thanks, Claire. Um, so we're gonna do a little introduction. Um, in our previous talk, we, uh, talked about uh, the review that we did of language archives. Um, and uh, we looked at it from the end user's perspective of somebody who's using the materials uh, that are deposited in language archives. So for this talk, um, it's more from the depositor's perspective. Um, and yeah, what depositors record, what they deposit, and how they organize it within language archives. Um, so uh, the depositor level and the archive level have a lot of interactions, um, and they affect each other. So um, having archive level protocols will create standards for the individual de depositors to follow. Um, and then also if the depositors um, uphold this, uh, the, the standards, then there's gonna be more consistency for inter-archive and uh, intra-archive usability. And then a little bit more on that, um, uh, this will help just clarify the role um, uh, of responsibilities between the people in the organizations who manage archives and archive sites versus the people who are depositing individual collections. Um, yeah, and it'll just, it'll make clear what the difference between the responsibilities in this process are. Um, so this is a flow chart. Um, and uh, you can see that there's a lot of lot of different things and um, it's not super crucial that you need to know what all the little little boxes are, but the big picture is that um, if you think of um, what is usually thought of to be, you know, the workflow of a field linguist um, or even just a linguist, you are gathering all of this uh, language data and, you know, you're analyzing, you're cleaning it, you're processing all this stuff. And then finally, um, there's this little circle at the bottom that says send to archive. And so um, it's kind of like all of this stuff is happening and then sending to archive is just the final step. Um, but we really want to uh, reiterate that, you know, archives can also be a great starting point for doing any sort of linguistic work or language reclamation and pedagogy work. So it's very important that we, um, streamline all of this stuff. Um, so the aims of the collection review, um, here are some of the questions that we're looking at. Um, how does current archival work work as um, input rather than output research? What current, or what current archiving practices facilitate or impede the use of digital corpora? Um, and what additional cyber infrastructure tools are needed uh, how do we go about building community-oriented resources for language research, language teaching, language reclamation from our corpora, and how do we make all of this um, a part of the linguistic research? And uh, finally, how can these corpora sustainably serve language documentation aims and language reclamation aims? Um, so we often see in linguistic papers just like something that basically says data were extensively cleaned, um, but there's not really uh, you know, much information about what the process of cleaning the data was, even though oftentimes that information would be really important for somebody who um, is then, you know, using the, the language materials in the archive or the collection um, to know so that they can, you know, uh, they can find or that they can use the, the material in, in very easy ways. Um, and so these are just examples of uh, basically the sentiment of data were extensively cleaned in papers uh, written in linguistics. Um, yeah, so we will be moving on to the methods and data of this. All right, um, so for our audit, we sort of took a top-down approach. Um, collections were chosen basically at random um, from a set of, of a diff from a set of archives. Um, and we ask questions such as, you know, what information is available in each collection? Um, is it like audio? Is it textual? Is it visual? Um, what sort of metadata, if any, is available? Um, what format is it? In? Is it in the browser or can you download it alongside the files? Um, what sort of audio material is there? Um, how long is it? Um, and how usable generally are the collection materials for force alignment? Um, so why force alignment? Um, it sort of acts as good stress test for collection. So it ensures that um, there's a certain quality of recording. Um, and it allows for testing of file corruption, transcript accuracy, 
accuracy and compatibility um, and file consistency. Um, right, and so having a force aligned pipeline lets us ensure that we have a consistent file type um, of data that meets certain standards, basically. Um, and transcription, there's this issue of a transcription bottleneck in that force alignment can really reduce the time it takes um, for researchers to get their, um, get their audio um, aligned. And so the data we looked at um, represents 20 different collections from six popular archives. Of course, we wanted to do more, but issues of funding came up. Um, and these 20 collections represent a worldwide distribution, as you can see on this map. Okay, so uh, here are some of the results that we found. Um, so uh, first and sort of most crucially um, were that there were some problems that made it impossible to work on the collections further um, towards uh, doing the forced alignment or other phonetic work. Um, so of the 20 collections that we looked at, 14 of them um, actually had no available sound files. Um, so the collection was only partially accessible um, 11 of them had irreconcilable metadata, meaning that the metadata information didn't match up with what was actually in the collection. So there was no way to know what was what. Um, and four of them had unprocessable transcripts, um, which means that either the transcripts were built into a web audio player, um, they were in an unparsable XML file or were just incomplete uh, in some way. Um, and on top of this, there were some other problems um, that were actually recoverable in the collection data, um, but added to the processing time quite a bit. Um, so out of the 11 that we were able to look at in some way, um, eight of them did not have matching metadata to files. Um, so there were uh, different file names. Sometimes this was a difference between an underscore versus a dash, for example, but if we're doing any kind of scripting or something like that, it's really important that you have the exact type of uh, the file name. Um, there was inconsistent tier use um, in the Elon tier transcriptions, for example. Um, so there would be notes in the uh, tiers that were supposed to be transcription, um, the orders of the tiers and the tier types within the collections were variable. Um, and of the five uh, collections that had Elon transcripts, two of them had no preserved Elon offsets, which means that the transcripts um, were not um, aligned correctly to the audio, so they had to be manually realigned. Um, and uh, this is in addition to the variation that we just expect in languages and the fact that these are different collections collected for different reasons at different times and things like that. Um, and uh, these problems, uh, were not uh, really foreseeable at the time when we started this project, but emerged uh, throughout the review. So that just shows the importance of um, doing this kind of work and looking systematically at archival collections. Um, so one example of a problem that uh, we were actually able to get fixed um, is that there was this uh, bug in the Montreal Forced Aligner um, where, which had to do with the um, Elon file to text grid conversion. Um, but uh, through doing this review, we were able to contact the people at the Montreal Forest Aligner um, and they were able to fix this problem. Um, so um, this is really great. It's great to have, be able to contact people and have people you know, read your email and respond to it. Um, and uh, we're really grateful for that and that's, it, also shows just the importance of doing this kind of work because um, you know this is a problem that may you know have come up in the past um, and people didn't know uh, what to do in order to address it or fix it um, and could have been a major roadblock for uh, people doing work. Um, so of these 20 collections that we looked at, three of them um, were successfully aligned. Um, so Isha, Liami, and Edelman um, and as we mentioned before, um, you know, work like this often says something like after the data were substantially cleaned and then don't really go into detail. So we do want to go into detail. Um, so the cleaning involved things like file renaming. Um, so renaming XML files as the EAF Elon uh, type files, um, version control in all of the different softwares and uh, scripting um, platforms and things that we were using, um, matching the transcripts to audio files when they were not 
uh, align properly. Um, removing non transcript items from the transcription line, such as, um, you know, notes or, um, you know, question marks or XXX or something like that. Um, uh, font and character encodings um, can cause problems, uh, especially if you're using a Windows system um, in terms of scripting. Um, so uh, we sort of corrected for that. Um, and then there were also various uh, grapheme to phoneme um, conversion problems in terms of getting things ready for the forced aligner. Um, so here's an example of a uh, version control uh, problem. So um, in this case, we have um, what is what is the same file, um, but in one case we have a revised version. As you can see, these ones that say dash rev uh, at the end. And so, of course, we want to use the revised version because that's the most uh, recent version of the file. Um, but the problem is when we are running a script, the script is going to find files that have the same names. Um, so it's going to match up the WAV file with the old version of the transcription file um, because the sound file and the uh, revised uh, transcription file don't have the same file name. Um, and here's another issue. Um, so yeah, having naming some uh, transcript file, um, you know, final or something like that, um, and things aren't going to match up properly. And so you'll end up having um, the old version of the transcript file, which may be much less complete um, than the new version. Um, and here are some examples of font and encoding issues. So there may be stray non-printing characters, uh, non-breaking spaces, single Chinese characters, um, encoding conversion errors. Um, so for example, legacy Mac files um, can be incorrectly saved as Unicode. So we have this example um, where, uh, you know, uh, recognizable word um, is just complete uh, gibberish and sort of like non-speech symbols um, in any transcription system that I'm aware of. Um, and so that causes a big problem and it's completely unrecoverable at that point if the file gets read and wrong. Um, and uh, there also are often delimiters in the wrong places. So having tabs or commas in your transcription can cause problems for different types of scripting because they'll be using those to mark um, like different columns in in a table or something like that. Um, and here's an example of uh, something we came across a lot, which is that uh, the transcription is sort of segmented into uh, utterances, but there's no actual transcription in the file. So uh, when you look at the collection, you see all of these transcription files, but then it turns out that a lot of them are just empty. Right, so in conclusion, we have um, a summary and uh, some recommendations. So first of all, we really need to emphasize consistency and accuracy in file naming practices, in data descriptions and transcription practices. This would involve, uh, would allow us to remove a lot of the issues around extensive cleaning of data and speed up work uh, that involves a pipeline of this type. Um, these practices could be standardized within a collection, even without individual archive setting protocols for the types of files that need to be uh, that need to be uploaded. We know that each individual collection is different and different circumstances of recording require different, um, uh, mean that collections are going to end up looking different, but even so things like consistency and file naming practice and data descriptions is a really important part of doing field work no matter what the end result is. Secondly, we uh, need to emphasize the inclusion of rich metadata. So things like the data recordings, speaker information, um, Sullivan 2020's data categories, uh, metadata categories are extremely useful for, uh, for thinking about the type of metadata that makes collections not only more usable, but usable to begin with. Another thing we'd like to emphasize is including settings files. So archiving is not just the raw data. We need settings files that allow us to interpret the data as part of um, using these, uh, these collections for subsequent work. For instance, files, uh, file settings that include the offsets for any transcripts and, uh, and audio linkages, for example. Uh, we also feel that we have just scratched the surface here with the 20 collections that we've looked at. Every collection that we examined 
brought an array of differing issues, differing problems, some things we saw recurring across the collections, but the details matter and the details were different from collection to collection. Um, so far, we have uh, not been able to secure funding for investigating these issues in more detail, and we will continue to pursue that, but we'd like to raise this paper so far, the uh, these preliminary results as an example of why it's important to look in more detail and look more widely as uh, as well. So just to summarize, if these are the takeaway points, so if you um, want to remember anything from this talk, rem remember these things. So while you're working on fieldwork collections, be as consistent as possible with all sorts of conventions and, uh, and decisions. Um, document the decisions both uh, for yourself as the compiler of archives and for um, potential uh, users in the, uh, in the future. While making the archival collection, uh, you could ask whether the file needs to be there. Um, and uh, if so, what, what would potential future users need that file for if it's not needable needed if it's not needed you could not include it but many of the files ancillary files that are created for archival collections are needed for future users um, we'd also recommend doing some tests on archived materials rather than your working collection as well so can you find everything that you need uh, from the collection that you intend to archive um, and perhaps also anticipate what might future users of this collection need that is not already present in the collection itself um, for the future, for um, uh, for our work and for, for others' work, we'd like to see some better infrastructure for corpus processing. So um, how to do automated validation checks, for example, to um, make it easier for um, for those compiling archival collections to make sure that everything is uh, is there. So um, just by way of summary, um, we've so we've done this as part of a pilot review of archives and so on, but these issues are not, um, uh, have been raised before. And in fact, they were raised almost 20 years ago by Bird and Simons, and they have been raised repeatedly since as, um, as well. But we just like to close by highlighting this, uh, this quote, um, that this issue is acute for endangered languages. Um, in the very generation when the rate of language death is at its peak, we've chosen to use moribund technologies and to create endangered data. Um, Bird and Simons, of course, were talking about things like open access to software um, and uh, particular file form we focus less on that and more on the uh, the types of archival practices that make collections more or yes uh, more or less useful when archiving is the uh, the beginning of a process rather than as the end result. But we recognize that this has been raised before, and so we need to continue to raise it so as to uh, to improve our collections and our formats. Uh, we just want to close with a reiteration of a point made earlier in this talk that we understand that archives do not receive the funding they need and they rely on a great deal of volunteer energy and labor to function. And the same is true for the creation of fieldwork corpora as, uh, as well, that um, uh, academic structures tend to reward publications of um, uh, uh, secondary data rather than the publications of the corpus materials themselves. Um, and that there are issues for funding for uh, this extremely time consuming work. And we truly appreciate that these are, these are issues and that these are substantial issues for linguistics as a field, as well as for individuals who are making choices about where to direct their energies. Um, we also believe, although we have raised a number of issues around particular collections, that an incomplete but archived collection is vastly preferable to not archived at all. Um, and uh, as a lab that works with endangered uh, language uh, data, both from archival collections and from shoeboxes, from basements and attics and so on, we, we really do appreciate that um, archives are an extremely important part of our field and archiving incomplete data is is vastly preferable to not archiving it at, um, at all. Uh, we should note that our opinions are what we've come to through our research, but we do not represent all opinions and views around archive use. Um, and um, as a, academics working on auditory data, we, um, uh, we have only uh, talked about a small selection of, uh, of materials that, um, that, that are included in, uh, in language archives more, more generally. Um, but we feel it's important to ask these questions and examine the current state of archiving options, given how important and irreplaceable language materials are that these archives hold. 
So with that, thank you very much for listening. We welcome uh, comments, questions, and uh, uh, and further feedback. And here are the references that uh, that we've used here.